Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the day two of web seminar series titled The Role of Women Negotiators and Mediators in the Maintenance of Regional Peace and Security. Thank you for joining our web seminar. A warm welcome back for those who joined us at yesterday's opening ceremony and first session. We would like to kindly inform you that the question and answer session is open to all participants. Questions can be asked through the Zoom chat features for those joining from Zoom, whereas others can address their questions through our Twitter and YouTube comment box. Twitter and YouTube account can be seen as screen. We will now start the second session of the web seminar titled The Role of Women as Negotiators and Mediators at the Peace Table. To moderate the session, we would like to invite Ms. Dewi Safitri Wahab, Special Advisor to the Minister on Socio-Cultural Affairs and Indonesian Diaspora Empowerment and Head of the Task Force on Gender Mainstreaming at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Indonesia to moderate the session. Ibu Dewi. Thank you. Good morning. Very good morning to all participants and especially thank you to the um, five, speak five speakers. We are entering second day of the role of women uh, negotiators and mediators in the maintenance of regional peace and security. I guess yesterday we had uh, a good um, uh, uh, discussion as well as after listening to the remarks by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now we are um, in the session two, we have five um, speakers. They are going to speak uh, on their experiences uh, doing the negotiation because they, they did the negotiation and mediators. They will also share their views, their experiences on how uh, the advantage and disadvantage of being um, uh, negotiators and um, uh, mediators, as well as uh, their views on how to increase more women uh, uh, negotiators and neg negotiators and mediators, and uh, of course uh, their views on how whether it's important to establish a network for. Uh, uh, for women negotiators and mediators in Southeast Asia. Uh, we have uh, five speakers. I would like to introduce uh, the first speakers, which is Professor Miriam Coronel Ferrer. She is currently a senior mediation um, advisor at the UN Department of Political Affairs and professor of politics at the University of the Philippines. She chaired the government panel that negotiated and signed the comprehensive agreement on Bangsa Moro with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in March 2014 and oversaw its implementation in the first two years. As the only Asian in the UN standby mediation team, she has been deployed to support the UN works in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, Maldives, and ASEAN region and she received Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women and Peace and Security. So without further ado, Professor Miriam, you have the floor, please. You have 10 to 15 minutes, Professor. Uh, please mind the, the time because uh, I think we would like very much to have more dialogues on your presentation. So the floor is yours, Professor Miriam. Thank you very much, uh, Ibu Dewi. And uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Republic of Indonesia, particularly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to really pushing this agenda, the Women, Peace and Security agenda in the region. It is something that we really need. And in fact, to show my appreciation, I wore a batik dress today. Something, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank I you. bought this dress when we went to Bandung for the review oh, nice. conference of the peace agreement between the Moro National Liberation Front and the Philippine government, which Indonesia was facilitating at that time. So Indonesia indeed has played very significant role in uh, our processes in the country, uh, particularly with the Moro National Liberation Front. 
in my case, I was involved with the negotiations with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front mm -hmm. and our facilitator was another member country of mm -hmm. uh, the ASEAN and that is mm -hmm. Malaysia. Mm -hmm. from, yeah. From, for my presentation today, I've actually prepared a set of slides that I would mm -hmm. now like to request um, our uh, Melati, our friend Melati, to start showing. It's about it's pictures about our process, so you get a better feel of how it was and how it looked like. Now, let me start my uh, my sharing of my experience with this reflection. First is that you don't really know when or how you will have this opportunity. But when it comes, it does help that everything that you did in the past, everything that you've done, like you prepared, uh, they actually help you prepare for this job. Meaning what you've read or studied before, all the answers about the conflict or the peace processes you've come up with before, the friends that you've made, across the table, even before there was no table, the integrity of your person as a professional as, and as an advocate. These are all political and social capital that will help you through. Uh, negotiations require good understanding of the issues and of course of yourself and the other. Now, how to build that consensus among yourselves and with the other side requires diligence and perseverance. And you can only succeed if you're able to find good compromises and creative approaches. You certainly need imagination. Be able to see all angles, think out of the box, find a good synthesis of the competing claims and entitlements because that's what negotiations is all about, to see how these differences can actually be bridged and uh, shared understanding and shared way forward can be arrived at. And don't give up because you just because you're not certain of the outcome. Now, I just noticed that my slide is not moving. It's supposed to be um, automatic, but maybe I will need the help of, um, of uh, Nelati to move the slide. There you are. You're seeing the slide, some of the men and the women in, in the talks. Um, it should move every 10 seconds. So in any case, in truth, one negotiates every day. The same life skills, your IQ, your EQ, are needed in negotiations. As in life, we need to be able to trust and to risk, to listen and to dialogue, to questions and to find the best answers. Although all our efforts, all our answers cannot be 100% perfect. We are all imperfect human beings. Uh, lodged in imperfect situational settings and saddled by a lot of historical baggage and enmities. Now, I did not represent any women's organization in the talk. As a government negotiator, I represented the government, specifically the Philippine president at the time, Simeon Benigno Aquino III. But in any case, a woman negotiator cannot but carry a responsibility for other women she gets looked upon as somebody who will carry out their cares. And as a human being in a community made weary by war, there will be concerns that will be brought to her by the women folk because they find it easier to approach her. Uh, their cares then become her responsibility. You know, once it's told to you, then you know you feel that you really have to do something about it. Therefore, you become, you know, an agent to project these concerns and agenda. Otherwise, these matters will just fall along the way, uh, on the wayside, maybe not addressed at all in the formal process. So you are able to do this because you have access to a lot of women. They are very much part of your social network and then they come to you as well. So I've experienced this kind of bonding uh, from, with women from all of walks of life who readily approached me with you know, enthusiastic handshakes and hugs. They gave their opinions and casually told personal stories and problems. They told me what they feel, what they think they needed to be addressed, their dreams. Um, and you know, they also get to, to be inspired by the fact that as women, we can do this. We can do this outside the homes and in the public spheres and actually take a leading, a leading role. So in our experience as a team this time, 
uh, it was very important to have teamwork. If you had a delegation, you must be able to maximize the strength of each member of your team. Uh, you have to open yourself to ideas from them, get their feedback. And I have to say that the men in our team were all good team players. Uh, by the end of the talks, there were three men and three women in the government panel. And we had a secretariat that was headed by women and a lot of female uh, uh, program officers as well as lawyers. And so we did have a female dominated team in the negotiation. And that kind of women's presence inside the room certainly normalized the presence of women especially to, uh, to people who have not been accustomed to being engaged in politics, being engaged in a pub, uh, very uh, political undertaking involving women and seeing that, well, it happens. And it's, it can be, it's something that, uh, that is not out of the, out of the or ordinary. So we did prepare and we strategize a lot for instance, how to gradually introduce gender provisions. So in the early part of the process, what we did by way of softening the ground was to hand over a copy of the UN Security Resolution 1325 uh, through the facilitator, because at the time we could not talk directly to the uh, negotiating panel of the Moorish Islamic Liberation Front and all documents had to be Facilita uh, had to be handed over to the protocol uh, to the to the facilitator was Tenku uh, uh, Gafar at this time of uh, from Malaysia and uh, that was part of the protocol and we handed the copy of 1325 just to emphasize that look these are international standards and in a way saying that um, a, a group like the more Islamic Liberation Front who wants to attain that kind of legitimacy in the international arena and have actually expressed that uh, desire, you know, to adhere by international standards, for instance, international humanitarian law um, uh, and, and so on. Um, but going beyond IHL, there is UN Security Resolution 1325 that actually advocates this. So as we move on in the negotiations, uh, we also wanted to make sure that there are crucial elements that are put in place. For instance, in as part of the agreement, we had a reiteration of rights that are to be observed and special mention to certain rights in the new autonomous government that was to be constituted as a result of the peace process. And we do have that now, uh, the Bangsamoor Transition Authority. And in this reiteration of rights, we included key elements such as non-discrimination, which is generic in a sense. This is found in the UN Convention on um, uh, Conventions on Human Rights. Non-discrimination on the basis of class, uh, race, religion, etc., and of course, on the basis of sex. And what, is in what was interesting in our discussion was that the, a member of the MILF panel expressed the concern that sex might not sound good to uh, to their religious leaders, their ulamas who will be reading the text. And he asked for an alternative word and we suggested the word gender. So, which is even a better term. And so you do have in our text saying non-discrimination on the basis of uh, gender. Privacy, we included in the specific reiteration of rights because, you know, we don't want morality police to be guarding everyone and uh, breaking into the privacy of individuals and so on. Uh, so privacy was enumerated then. And then finally, meaningful political participation. Meaningful political participation, which really entailed a lot of discussion uh, as to what we meant by the word meaningful. And of course, our emphasis on the political participation because this is what was gross, grossly missing uh, in the public sphere. Uh, freedom from all forms of violence is uh, definitely was definitely included the whole agenda of violence against women and how did we bring in more women into the talks um, one is it was noticeable that there was no woman from the other party so there was actually a lot of soft pressure coming in from both the domestic community and the international community for the more Islamic Liberation Front to include women in their 
in their negotiating uh, delegation. And we were told that, well, unfortunately, their delegation, their panel was already constituted according to ethnic representation, which is true and which, which is also very important. And it was going to be difficult for them to basically, um, um, you know, uh, upset the current composition of uh, the panel. But, but bringing in women, women became possible because what we did was to increase the table, the seats inside the room. Increasingly, we opened up the space to more consultants. When we move into the discussion of the annexes, uh, we had technical working groups that we created. There were four technical working groups. And, uh, and we in the government panel had three technical working groups headed by women, all experts in their own right. Uh, the economic, uh, the wealth sharing uh, technical working group was headed by the regional director of the National Economic Development Academy, and she, she, she was supported by another woman, the head of the Bureau of Tax Division in the Ministry of Finance. The head of the Normalization uh, Committee was headed by uh, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Se Secretary General of the National Security Council, a, a woman who rose up to the ranks and is actually presently a member of the National Police Commission. And uh, uh, a feminist woman from the Moro community, one of the early Moro feminists, uh, uh, Yasmin Busran Lau, headed, uh, headed our negotiating team for the transitional arrangements and uh, modalities. Uh, eventually, the MILF brought in also female lawyers, very, very good female lawyers, whom they depended a lot for, a lot, uh, for the technical issues, uh, as well as you know, the groundwork that you needed to be to engage the other uh, the their counterparts from our team to work out certain uh, certain documents that we were producing so that's how eventually we, we were able to get in more and more women inside the room then the negotiations were also opened up to observers observers from civil society from women's groups and every now and then they would come in and see what was going on it was very important for them to witness how talks are actually happening so that they will understand the dynamics. You know, it's not easy. Sometimes when you're outside viewing the process from the outside, you wonder why it's taking too long. You wonder why, you know, they cannot agree on many of these things. But once you're inside the room, you realize exactly how difficult each and every item is that is being discussed. And we, the, the fact that we had observers actually coming in, I, I think they, they're able to relay that and share to the rest of their civil society, civil society networks. Now, it was also very important that not only the women were speaking out on women's issues, otherwise you sort of get branded, oh, here she goes again, she's saying the same thing over and over again. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of women are, are um, being appreciated or misappreciated. So it was very important that uh, also the men speak up. I think yesterday there was the point about the importance of having male champions. And certainly it's good that the members in our team, the male members on our team were very supportive of the women's agenda. So for instance, on having to do on, uh, it was important that our male professor who is a religious scholar, a scholar in Islamic jurisprudence will uh, cite visions in the Quran actually justifying uh, these kinds of norms, uh, gender norms that we were, we were advocating. Um, then, of course, if you're in the power, precisely, I mentioned to you that uh, the heads of our technical working groups, three out of four were actually women. And, and that's because we were appointing more women. I mean, if you're in a position to appoint, uh, uh, and uh, the pres uh, presidential advisor on the peace process, Teresita Quintos Deles, uh, uh, was certainly in that kind of position. I recommended to her several names, and definitely because we knew a lot of women, we, they were part of our awareness level, they were part of our socialization, so we knew who the good women are. We got precisely uh, that kind of uh, uh, position, you know, the idea of women appointing women which we have been propagating as well as one of the approaches. Uh, then it's very important uh, to precisely create the support structures because 
any women in public life will face a lot of challenges. There's sexism in social media and you need other women to say stop that kind of uh, sexist comments that you will find in social media, in interactive websites, in Facebook accounts, in tweets, all kinds of these tweet, uh, memes that who, from coming from, uh, uh, from sectors who do not support the peace process or who see that we are weak negotiators because we are women. So you need that kind of support structure coming from the bigger society, women's group who will speak up and defend, defend the process, defend the women negotiators. And there were also some practical considerations. For instance, the head of our secretariat at the time was a breastfeeding mother. So there had to be special provisions for her you know, there had to be time out for her to be able to suppress some of the milk. She, we were staying for several days, even weeks, even 10 days in Kuala Lumpur for our negotiations. And she was breastfeeding. And, and then she had to bring, uh, bring back this uh, collected milk for, for her child. At one time, we had troubles with uh, getting through the x-ray machine because this was the time when they were really, really bare street, no liquids in your hand carry items or anything like that. And, and you, you know, these things be, assume really, really have some very practical, uh, practical implications and they have to be supported. In the case of the women in the MILF, in the beginning, it was important for the first woman that they brought in, Attorney Raisa Jajuri, to be accompanied by a makram, a male relative. And that, of course, created some uh, inconvenience for uh, relatives, male relatives who had to come with there. But eventually, that problem was solved when they brought in another woman, so the two women can actually accompany themselves and protect themselves and probably also stay in the same room. Uh, in the company of uh, the other men in the delegation, uh, especially during meetings that they have to do among themselves because there will be breakout meetings where the panels will be convening and uh, assessing what has happened and then plotting as well their next, uh, next move. Now, some of the other things that we tried to do was, uh, well, just an anecdote, for instance, we have been buggering the MILF to open up the women in their armed forces, yeah. uh, particularly the Bangsamoro Islamic Armed Forces, or in, uh, arm, the Bangsamoro Islamic Women's Auxiliary Brigade. And it took us Excuse some time. Excuse me, Professor, yes. you have one, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So 30 seconds. I will conclude by saying that you, there will be a lot of challenges so, uh, so we have to support all the women who are put in this position. We have sure. to do our own organizing. And then mm. for all of us, we certainly have to be creative. We have to think out of the box and find different ways and means to overcome all the obstacles that are put on the way, historically have been there, and all the new things that are being thrown to make things more difficult for our work. So I'll end there and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I know um, it, the, you, you still have a lot of things to say, interesting to say, but, um, but uh, uh, let's wait until the uh, question and answer. Uh, uh, friends and colleagues, we have second speaker, which is Ms. Sadia uh, Marhaban. Uh, Ibu Sadia, how are you? We, we met last, last year in Bali. Uh, Miss yes, Adia Marbo, hello, how are you? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam, Ibu. Bu uh, Sadia uh, was a support team member of the Free Aceh Movement Peace Negotiating Team in Helsinki that ended the 30 years conflict peacefully. She was exiled in the United States and returned to Aceh after the peace agreement in 2007. And upon her return, Mr. Marhaban was actively engaged in peaceful dialogues throughout Southeast Asia, Colombia, Nepal, Afghanistan, uh, Cameroon. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Marhaban spe specializes in mediation that is focused on political transition, ceasefire, disarmament, and reintegration of female former combatants. She is now um, consultant for UNDP, ASEAN, Bergo Foundation, and Mediators Beyond Border. So, Ibu Shadia, uh, 
the floor is yours. I think you're going to speak um, your experience with regard to the Aceh peace, um, uh, medi uh, peace um, negotiation. So the floor is yours, Miss Yadia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, for the government and also the office uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for organizing this uh, this discussion. I think it's uh, quite timely, even in the pandemic time, that we still be able to manage this uh, this discussion. Uh, I would like to also take this opportunity uh, uh, to uh, heartfelt, heartfelt condolences to my former GAM negotiating member who recently passed away at the age of 73. He is uh, Mr. Nurdin Abdurrahman. He was the former of uh, Bupati of uh, Biran between 2006 and 2011. Um, and uh, he has been also uh, a supporter of women and also a mentor uh, and a teacher to me. So, inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi roji'un. Uh, and as we know that this uh, talk is, we are more focusing on the role of women. I would say that uh, Professor uh, Ferrer already mentioned a lot in her presentation about the role of women in terms of uh, during the negotiation. But in our case, because I was, I was representing the armed struggle, so the condition is a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit unique in the sense uh, between the period of 2001 to 2003, there was a dis uh, negotiation in Helsinki. However, that was that negotiation was uh, falling apart, uh, and so it ended uh, with martial law in the year 2003. That was under uh, President Megawati Sukarno Putri, uh, and so uh, many of the GAM negotiators were arrested. Uh, and was brought into prison in Java, and also uh, uh, some of them uh, have uh, died during the tsunami in 2004. So that lead us to uh, a lack of negotiators, like we don't have many negotiators that are available uh, on hand. So during the Helsinki process, uh, the leadership uh, took up the initiative to invite those who are living abroad because of the security issues uh, that maybe we will have, a, 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 we will face a problem when we return to Indonesia. So that was one of the reason. Uh, and this, with this also a uh, big appreciation to the team in the Free Aceh Movement in GAM for involving women and also taking uh, some of the advice uh, uh, from women on, on certain issues. I believe the importance of uh, peace is very clear in, in creating a lasting peace. And what I mean by creating lasting peace is preparing a, a, a comprehensive peace agreement. And sometimes this process is, is only allowed two things. First is the commitment. The second thing is, is a sincere process because we can have a 6,000 pages of peace agreement, but if it's not applicable, then it will be very difficult for us to implement. No peace process is perfect, I believe, and peace process is an ongoing process. Uh, and for me to see the, the pleasure is seeing the peace process keep on moving, uh, having more and more uh, women, men and women to be involved, uh, getting a deeper understanding, and we, we can see the clarity what went wrong. Uh, and this is the ongoing process. Uh, even 15 years ago, in 2005, when we signed the peace agreement August 2005. But for me, as if this is still like yesterday. Uh, and uh, this process is very important for women to also to um, anticipate that there will be a phases of crisis in every peace process. Um, and to look also that peace process to me is also a little bit chaotic because it's not a perfect process overemphasizing on certain issues such as decommissioning, um, giving out the, their weapons also problematic, over-focusing on development too much also will lead to greed and corrupt new government. So everything has to be balanced. And I think uh, this is the importance of the role of women. Women leads to moderation. Women leads to balance idea and thinking. 
and this is what I feel that my role was being um, uh, useful in, in Helsinki is to see things in a moderate and a balanced way. Um, the dynamic of peace process is another challenge because dynamic is uh, quite fast. How to manage expectation? Uh, because peace process for some, it's not an end, it's a process. Some consider it as a breathing space. Some armed group consider peace process as a, as a breathing space and continue to struggle. Some armed revolutionary keep pushing for bigger agenda nationally, as we see maybe in Latin America and some other parts of the world. And some sincerely wants to create a peaceful change in the society. So I think the commitment the commitment for peace and sincerity, this is the key to a su successful one. Whatever motives of the uh, armed groups of government during negotiation, all ended up with the questions, can we sustain this? Can we live with this peace process? Is this process workable and applicable? And if we admit mistakes, would we, be, would we be willing to fix them? So I think that is the biggest questions for, for, for all of us as negotiators and mediators. And in my own experience that I can reflect after 15 years that women plays an important role in maintaining unity and sustaining peace. Many literatures, research and studies talking about this. Women also should participate in rehabilitation and reconstruction. Uh, in the case of Aceh, in fact, after the tsunami, uh, December tsunami in 2004, many uh, women uh, were educated compared to men because of the war. So many women are hired by the international organization, by the tsunami relief organization, and also post-conflict management organization. So this is also a, um, a big plus and a big win for, for women. Um, the other thing that I reflect is also that women should aim higher, not just getting women to the peace table. I think we should aim even higher than that, but engaging women in, in, peace pro in comprehensive peace process and also engaging them in post peace processes because the post peace process is actually the nitty gritty, the importance why women should be there. The, this, this is another uh, uh, thinking is to transform our mind that uh, having women sitting on the table, if we cannot translate it to a, a workable process, it, it is also um, uh, not so much benefit for, for the women. So I think we have to look into both. The other important is the transformation, the trans how the women transform themselves. If you are being a negotiator or a mediator, how do you see, how do you transform yourself? In my case, I see that I want to do more peace. So that's why I get engaged in many uh, peace processes, including advising many armed groups all around the world. You know, Should they need an advice? Should they need um, more information about negotiation? I'm there to help. You know, so th this this is the kind of even small transformation, you know, um, that could lead to to something uh, bigger. And also, uh, I think suffer suffering is important. You know why I say like this, because my own experience that the most suffering time is actually the more I see light. You know, uh, I'm saying this because the way I see women, I don't victimize them but I'm helping them to grow and be part of a peaceful society. Because if we see just them as a victim, you know, we need to help them as a victim. We don't see the, the society grow. We only see the society moving from one stage to another. But if we help them in uh, maintaining their dignity and also be with them together in, 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 uh, in mentoring, in teaching and learning together with the women, I think this is much more a beautiful process. That's how I see it. Uh, the other thing is that women shouldn't just limit their knowledge on women, uh, uh, you know, particular issues, but also power sharing, constitutional drafting, ceasefire, disarmament, political transition. We heard Professor Ferrer talk about her work, you know, with the mediation support unit at the UN level. This is the kind of thing that we want. Dimension of political reconciliation, 
institutional reform, conflict coaching, transitional justice, those are the areas that women should grasp immediately. And I think these are an open room for, for women to be uh, part of this uh, uh, engagement in uh, and also increasing role of women in negotiation and also mediation. Uh, and also some of the knowledge that women have. Uh, whether it's natural resources, water conflict, food, food security, political reform, even the, the today's pandemic. Many women, in fact, engage and involved in COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, disaster in their country. And many women are not being documented that are working on this particular issue. So we start to use these elements, using the social media positively, uh, uh, to engage more women in 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 uh, in issues that will also uh, people might say this is not just the issue of women you know which I don't know what are the issue of women to be honest but but some people like to generalize it in, in that sense like oh these are just the issue of women let's let's talk about something else so by having women in in those different uh, capacity. Uh, we will increase also the number of women in negotiators and, and nego uh, negotiation and also mediation. The other, the last one is maximizing insider mediator. We haven't used the capacity uh, on maximizing the insider mediator. Many of insider mediator are women. Like for example, I work in Mindanao. Many of the women are working in the community level, in the provincial level, even in the barangay. Uh, that they are participating in, in, in mediation and also in trying to make peace with everybody. So this can be used uh, as also as, as an instrument or tools to increase the role of women in negotiation. The last but not least is also it's documenting women mediators work and, and feature them uh, in, in televisions or even social media, Twitter and, and so on. And I think by engaging um, women and also having them uh, feature in media, then many people can see that the role of women is, is also uh, important. And uh, let's, let's not just see the role of women, but also see the, ch the male champion, those who are supporting women, like my own colleague who recently passed away. He was a big, bigger supporter for women. And those are the kind of people that we need. Uh, we need to collaborate more with men uh, men who are supporting women and we need to collaborate also with government that are uh, willing to support uh, women. Um, and uh, last but not least, of course, I want to thank you also for my, my government, for the government of Indonesia, for helping uh, and maintaining the peace uh, that we are experiencing, that we are still breathing peace for the last 15 years. And this is a tremendous work for both of us not just uh, from GAM, but also from the government of Indonesia. And I, and I would like to take this opportunity, opportunity to thank you, especially for, for this effort. So thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you, Ibu Shadia, uh, for your um, uh, expose. I think uh, you see the role of women from a different angle, which is uh, balancing and give a moderation uh, outlook uh, with regard to the uh, peace negotiation, as well as whether peace, you can live with that peace and whether the peace process and the peace settlement uh, is sustainable. I think that that's um, another, that's, uh, that, that's important. Uh, outlook uh, you have just said uh, and we are going to discuss more on on this issue uh, and as well as uh, the importance of having male champion uh, in supporting more women to be able to come to the table for negotiation and uh, mediating and mediation uh, the third speaker is miss leonesa tecla da silva she is currently national consultant for women, peace and security, uh, Timor-Leste. She was previously program coordinator at the Asia Foundation Timor-Leste. She was um, active as a mediator to support the facilitation of the reintegration processes for the inter internally displaced person affected 
by the 2006 crisis. She has more than 14 years of experiences with all stages of various community development of project in the areas of peace building. Ms. Da Silva, you have the floor and uh, kindly uh, don't forget to also uh, share your view whether we need uh, a network for women negotiation and mediators in Southeast uh, Asia. You have the floor, uh, Ms. Da Silva, 15 minutes. You have the time for your presentation, please. I can I cannot hear your voice. You unmute that. You you have you unmute that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. You good. hear me? Yes. Good. Very good. Okay, selamat pagi or selamat siang, good morning or good afternoon uh, to Ibu Dewi, to my speaker colleagues and audience. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Timor-Leste and Indonesian Embassy in Timor-Leste and, MF, and MFA Indonesia, especially as the ASEAN Department for organizing this important discussion to bring all the influences peace builder regionally. And it's it's an honor to be here, yeah, honestly. Um, I was going to share a, a conflict resolution mechanism in Timor-Leste and how the adaptation of women, peace and security, UN resolution 1325 um, in Timor-Leste. May I ask Melati to show this slide, please? Thank you, Mbak Melati. Uh, in April 2006, this affected army troops clashed with drug violence that forced up to 150,000 people to seek refugee in 65 camps across the country. And most saw the refugee in the government building, school, church, and subsequently make shift camps and killed up to 38 people and destroy 1,650 homes. Next, Mbak Melati. In response to the displacement resulting from the 2006 political crisis that proximate causes are widely attributed to the introduction of regional antagonism, which is, we call it, um, East, in, in our language, we call it the Lora Sai versus West, uh, Lora Mono. And the internal dynamics of the security forces and political leadership. And also the Timorese government undertook a series of initiatives aimed at facilitating integration and dialogue between the displaced and their return or resettlement communities. Um, this range from visit to IDP camps uh, by the president uh, at that time, uh, uh, Mr. Zeramo Zorda, a Nobel Peace Prize, and the Minister of Social Solidarity, uh, who was given primary responsibility for IDP related issues. Individual, they go and see and come and talk and visit. And there also a large scale community ceremony based on traditional uh, rights and individual mediation of land and property disputes and mass information campaigns. So in Timor-Leste, we are uh, culturally, we ha we already have a kind of like a, a dialogue, a traditional mechanism, which is uh, from our ancestors very strong. So uh, the good that they, our government, they are using this mechanism and try to solve the conflict that uh, uh, occurred in, in the 2006 uh, crisis. And a key component was the, the so-called dialogue team, where I was a part of the team. It's established by the Ministry of Social Solidarity as part of the together building confidence uh, of the pillar of national 
recovery strategy. These dialogue teams play a central part in the working with IDPs, affected communities, relevant local authorities, and the line ministries to prepare a smooth over retard and resettlement process. Uh, we uh, mostly engage with the local peace uh, making and reconciliation process, tackle social problems where necessary, and reveal the relationship among community members for sustainable returns of IDPs through mediation and dialogue using the traditional mechanism. Uh, the, another success that we get at that time is because we work very closely with the land ministry, uh, such as um, uh, national police, the minister of justice, uh, especially land and property directorate, if we have any cases that related to land and disputes, and we work also with the international agencies such as Land International, Oxfam, if there is a, a issues that we would like to relate it to the social conflict, then they also have a, they are some of their volunteers mediators. So they, we work together for the this reintegration of IDPs. And at that time, this dialogue team is um, basically supported by UNDP at that time in 2008. And um, there is a difference between what I see uh, there that there is a difference between men and women as mediator. Women mediator has different approaches, uh, which is we use um, kind of like, kind of like a, uh, we can convince the both conf conflicting parties. We also encourage them in the dialogue meeting and talk to them slowly. And people, especially women, are very openly and confident to talk uh, their concerns. Also, uh, for the um, men, the, they they also uh, willing to share what they, they have faced. So then we analyze the root of conflict with communities and make contact regular to make sure there is no more tension exists. A uh, woman mediator also uh, can convince both parties in conflict to come to the table. Broad meaning of the issues discussed, increasing the change community to address root of causes and greater pressures on the parties to reach an agreement as well as woman participation can make agreement lasting. Next, Mbak Melati. Uh, launch of national action plan on UN resolution 1325 on, on women peace and security in 2016 is another remarkable achievement for the promotion of gender equality in Timor Leste. Since the adoption of resolution 1325, there has been a substantial increase in the frequency of gender responsive language in peace agreement and the number of women, women's group and gender experts who have served as official negotiator and mediator. And currently, the Minister of Interior as the main lead for NAC 1325, working with other line ministries to align the NAC 1325 into the ministry's budget and the program. And it was recognized uh, by a Secretary General of the UN in 2019, I guess, yeah out of five countries in the world for the implementation of NAP 2013-25, especially women's participation in peacekeeping mission, protecting civic space, and the work of peace builders and human rights defenders. So this is another a success that the, the government of Timor-Leste had so far. And the Secretary of State for another um, uh, focus also, the Secretary of State for for equality and inclusion also push forward the implementation of CEDO, NAP, uh, gender-based violence. And we also have another declaration, we call it Maubisi Declaration. Uh, Tibor is also, we, what do we have uh, learned so far and we noticed that Timor's, Timorese government have been adopted the legal framework, which is convention treaties and laws locally and uh, globally. Next, Bhatmalati. A discussion about respects for women's rights. 
often remind to the notion of balancing country, the tradition in Timor Leste is deeply embedded with communities, and there is a general perception of its immobility. As gender in inequalities and violation of women rights are frequently driven by groups of individuals, and rather than stated, the discussion around the need to lay legis state or not, the ADR process in Timor Leste they can also provide an opportunity for communities to engage and determine the way forward. Next, Mbak Melati. Uh, it's about um, between women and men satisfied with traditional system because the availability of the service closer to the people's home, the lower cost involved, the faster process of the cases, the familiarity of the process and judgment, the use of the local language, the high likelihood to come to a resolution of the issues, active reconciliation with other parties and the community. Next, Mbak Melati. A Timor Leste woman as a survivors, perpetrators, victims, combatants, activities, activists, and advocates. Women play active and multiple roles in peace process. Particularly, they are agents of negotiators and mediators of today. Which is not only today that we have from the Minister of Interior and also with from other uh, public defenders, ombudsman office, they have a, a representation of women mediators, but it's very, very small, which is from the Ministry of Interior. They have a, a they have around, uh, they have around uh, 18% women mediators and from other, also from other uh, ministerial office, they also have uh, mediators. But what we have seen so far is that in the Indonesian time, when there is a fight in between the Indonesian, Indonesian and Timor-Leste, but women already have played a role as a mediator where in the small discussions between the conflict parties in the in the jungle, they also took part at uh, that. But our patriarchal system is very strong. So uh, sometimes uh, there is a little bit of uh, space uh, for the women mediators or for women as a participant to take part in the, the discussion. However, their roles in conflicts are not highlighted and their long involvement in the mediation and peace process is barely discussed in the literature. Women's mediator roles at the formal levels have served as a blueprint for negotiators. Women have also played an important role as peace actors at the grassroots. Next, Mabalati. Uh, I noticed that there are some existing community-based practices of mediators, community of women, peace and security in South East Asia, as well as um, the End Peace Community in Philippines late in 2013. I, I saw Mbak uh, Sadia when we attended this um, launching of the End Peace for those um, peace builders. Regionally. And it was quite good. So I'm thinking that why not we are use work? So then negotiator, how many mediators that we have currently in, in our uh, country? So then we can, uh, it's kind of like, a, a let's discuss whether peace builder, mediators or negotiator can be part of this community to exchange the experiences. And there has been a wealthy community best practices. We cannot, we can uh, connect to uh, and build a network for further exchange program in conflict resolution and resilience related issues. And I also noticed that the UN women uh, also uh, have um, uh, a 
various uh, community based of practices. So we can use we can use their uh, their network and then the, as a uh, professor Miriam is here, Mbak Sadia, they have uh, more experiences than the mediators. They have uh, skills and um, uh, advanced uh, mediators. And then why not if we have uh, some of our mediators in the country, so then we can lead to have some of their sharing experiences to the mediators uh, uh, so far. Yeah, I um, think um, uh, this is what I'm, uh, I would like to share with you. So we hope that we have a, a chance to, to share whatever uh, question that might be raised from uh, the audience and, the, and I'm happy to, to share with you. Thank you. Terima kasih Ibu Da Silva Obrigada. Thank you, Bu Da Silva. Um, uh, I think you um, you uh, gave us another perspective, uh, which is um, a different role of women, uh, the approach, because more uh, women tend to be more uh, understanding to both sides, more patient to listen to both sides, as well as the role of community and the capacity of women uh, 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 it's it's uh, it's heartening to uh, to hear that you have 18% of women uh, mediators in in Timor Leste uh, i think that that's wonderful perhaps you can uh, discuss more on on this issue and your idea on on community of uh, mediators and uh, negotiators uh, the four, uh, the fourth um, speakers is Miss Charmaine de Bakonga. Can I? Am I spelling it right? Bakonga, Bakonga, Bakonga. Miss Charmaine Bakonga is corporate secretary of Balai Mindanao. She is also executive director of the Resource Center for Empowerment and Development and heads the operations. Peace course program. She's mainly involved in community based peace building work, which is very suitable with uh, the, the, um, with, uh, the issue that raised by Ibu Da Silva, the role of community. And, and she took part in formal peace talks as a member of the Independent Secretariat for GRPRPM and Peace Process and in the peace education as a trainer and accompanier. She was also involved in the campaign for GRP and DPF peace process, as well as the GPH MILF peace process. So, uh, Ms. Bangonga, uh, you have 15 minutes uh, for your presentation. The floor is yours. Yes, hello. Hello. We can hear you, Bu, Ibu, yeah. Miss Bango. Yeah, uh, ah. how about my video? Your face is all white. What happens? There. Ah, there. And we can see you. <laughs> white is again. Okay? Uh, white again. You're white again. I already changed it. Mm. There. Ah, that's good. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. <laughs> there okay so good morning everyone or good afternoon thank you very much for this opportunity to share um, i am humbled by this invitation to share my experience and the peace process that happened years ago yet has been the source of inspiration for me and for balay mindanao in pursuing community-based peace building work as a foundation for peace process and reaching an agreement or not. So can you please show the presentation? Yeah. Um, my sharing now is going to be based on my experience in the, the other peace process in the Philippines way back in 2003. Uh, peace process between the government of the Republic of the Philippines and the Revolutionary Workers Movement, uh, Movement Party in Mindanao. 
uh, revolutionary partido na magagawa ng Mindanao. Um, yes. Um, I'm very happy as well to be sharing with fellow women with whom I have met years ago, Professor um, Ie, during reflection session with different revolutionary groups engaged in this process way back in 2007. And now she and she headed the government panel for MALF, uh, I mean GRP, and MALF talks, and also with Shadia, uh, my trainer and mentor with MBD and Amporn, my fellow classmate, and happy to meet also Mom, um, Tesla from East Timor. Um, yes, so my experience, um, next slide please. Yeah. Um, I would just like to share this statement because uh, in most questions or in most experiences in terms of peace building or peace process, many are uh, the experiences in violent conflicts. Women are always the most vulnerable, even children and youth. And then in most discussions, it's always said that women are the ones victimized. But I think drawing from the experience of Deka Ibrahim Abdi, I would say and affirm and also always share this statement, I refuse to be a victim and I am a resource for peace. So next slide. My experience, uh, that's the outline. Next slide, please. My experience in the peace process is not being the main negotiator or main mediator between parties. My experience began in 2003 with Balay Mindanao, the organization where I'm working with before and even until now, as a member of the Independent Secretariat to the Peace Process. The mediator then, uh, the, still the mediator of the peace process is Kaloy, our president of the organization. But my role then was part of the Independent Secretariat. Okay, please, um, one more Make the animation. Yes, just continue the animation, please. Click, click. Uh, yes. Okay. Please just continue until one more. One more. Okay. okay. So let me share with you that uh, about the peace process first for the context of the experience where I'm drawing my learning experience. For the GRP or PMM peace talks, there are two, uh, it's a parallel track. First, there is a formal talks where it is a talk amongst the principals, the two parties, and there is a mediator with Kaloy, and then they are basically discussing the political settlement. The second track, sec in the framework, which was agreed by both parties, is a peace consultations. And these peace consultations are a discussion amongst communities and tribes. And in these uh, peace consultations, basically, it talks about the situation of the communities. So going back to the framework, this is then set by both parties. Empowered and sustainable communities are the real um, source of discussion, one of the major inputs to the political uh, settlement that's going to be discussed by the parties. So that's um, where my experience is it. So looking back in 2003, I reflected that these talks can be a very tedious process. It is a process that is intended or seemingly to end war, violence, conflicts that affect families, communities, organizations, um, interstate or interstate actors. This ended a peace process that requires a lot of courage and a willingness to risk the enemy at the negotiating table as well as the communities. Trust and confidence is needed by both parties and with the people helping the negotiating parties to keep the parties talking. The process required a lot of patience in crafting agreements pursuing delayed commitments, and accepting that sometimes agreements fail. The process also requires a lot of openness, sincerity, and patience, both between the parties directly involved in the process and for those who feel the impact of the conflict, which are the communities. 
in the Philippines, there are several peace processes that have been um, that have reached an agreement. But for this particular peace process, um, there is no political settlement that has been um, uh, reached upon. However, the peace process is still for us an ongoing process because the communities are still there. Next slide, please. So I would like to focus on one of the major um, track of the peace process, which is, which is the local peace consultations. The local peace consultation is an integral part of the framework of the GRPRPMM peace process. One of the first documents signed by both panels in the first round of the formal talks was to institutionalize the participation of peoples and communities through the conduct of barangay or village and tribal consultations. The LPCs, we call LPCs, are three-day participatory workshops that aim to identify community resources, to surface sectoral and conflict issues, human resource, land use, economic development, agri-aqua development administration, and to craft a plan that includes strategies in pursuing the tribal land ancestral domain claims, and some of the and the target who are participating in this are the leaders and representatives of the different sectors. And we encouraged women to be represented in these issues, in, in this gathering. So in this uh, LPC, there's an emphasis on conflict profiling, conflict discussions. And at the same time, there's that uh, analysis that is generated both by the facilitators and the communities who are participating. And the results of these consultations are being forwarded to the panels to, by the secretariat. So there's an independent secretariat as Malay Mindanao, and then there's a secretariat from the GRP, and there's a secretariat for the RPMM. So all these are being gathered and asked the independent secretariat forward this to the panels, both panels. So in, since 2003, there, we've targeted 100 villages for this, and then we have finished 89, and then many of these communities have already implemented programs. And government also supported some of the priority programs that have been identified by the communities. Other international agencies also supported the projects that have been proposed to them by the community themselves. With this experience we have, there's no more ongoing talks between the two parties right now. But when we look back to the communities and met them again, they're still implementing already the projects and continue it. And one salient feature to that is the integration or the mainstreaming of peace consultations in their processes at the community level. So if they are, if the communities we've met years ago in mainstream it, for us, we have also adopted it as our key component in all engagements, in popularizing and in providing support to the ongoing or the peace process between the GPHMILF peace talks, GRP and DF as well. So we gather communities, talked about issues and concerns, and also providing them updates on the peace process. Okay, next, please. Next slide. So these are already examples. So in 2003, we started with many communities. And then as we continue working with different villages in Mindanao involving the peace process, we have adopted it. So in one community that's already in, um, in Surigao del Sur, very much involved in GH and DFP peace talks. And the other picture is in the Aliosan, North Patabato, also very much involved in the GPHMILF peace talks. Next. Okay. On the question then now, reflecting back on my experience on the peace talks, in, uh, where I've met a lot of communities from all walks of life, from different tribes of Mindanao who have been impacted by the different violent conflicts. And then um, we've met them during the peace consultations. 
and we encouraged men and women to really participate in the discussion. And for us as facilitators in these processes, we've met a lot of challenges. And also reflecting back, we feel that at the negotiating table, uh, for us, we are very much the support to those who are facing each other, support to the parties that are facing um, uh, at the formal talks at the peace table. So uh, based on the sharing uh, experience for me, when I was asked the question to share my experience on or the perspective and how do we increase women at the negotiating table as mediators or as negotiators, for me, I find it that women, for us, the experience, women has the audacity, strength, and that power inside. And it's coupled with gentleness and nurturing nature, help many communities. We also have the endurance to continue. When sometimes the talks are so... Um, heated, discussions are heated. We push through for enduring no matter what we are already doing the task that needs to be done. For us, so as we've involved a lot of communities, I felt and I reflected back that women are effective in, effect, in bringing people together, setting up a calm mood in times of conflict, firm, yet gentle, focused, yet creative. So how do we bring in more women to engage in peace talks? Next slide, please. For me, it has, women should be provided the access for capacity building and support. Reflecting on my experience as part of uh, our involvement in the peace talks, I underwent peace building training. The first training I had was Operation Peace Courts. It was a one month course from lectures to workshops to exposures and to planning that includes personal transformation as well as societal transformation. More trainings and seminars came, and I'm happy to meet Shadia through MBB and many women in that training. And you I have think, one minute, one minute to go. Yes. So, yes, the training. And I think it's also with all this training that is provided, I think moving towards men, women to be involved, I think we have to be pushed or given the opportunity to take part in the formal talks. Do it to balance. Do it. Go. And I think the third, women need to have a community. The support system that we need, experience, sharing of experiences, and we learn together. And lastly, I think women have a great role in peace education. For the longest time, um, we have trained many people and I have also drawn my experience and my confidence to the peace education that I've underwent with many women peace educators. So for me, in general, women should be given the opportunity to participate. Next slide, please. For us, um, peace is a revolutionary um, concept. And if the tasks are daunting, it's very real. And Ten if seconds. Are we for it? Are we involved? Are we willing to do it? And the answer is yes. So that's this last slide. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Miss uh, uh, Miss Charmaine Bangonga. I think Bakonga. Yes. Uh, um, I think you have uh, give another important perspective, which is um, uh, community. Uh, uh, in order to be able uh, the peace uh, settlement sustain, you need to have a community consultation, and you need to bring more people more women uh, in this community uh, consultations. Uh, the last speaker, uh, uh, 
uh, this, this, uh, my, uh, distinguished participants, we have Dr. Ampon Marden. Dr. Am, uh, Dr. Ampon Marden is anthropologist and head of the Center of Excellence on Women and Social Security at Wailak. Walailak University, Southern uh, Thailand. She's an expert on the use of mediation in cases of gender-based violence in the Southern Thai provinces and building capacity of women mediators. Her areas are many, but among others are Muslim feminism, women and peace building, gender and preventing violent extremism, political Islam and women movement. Since 2001, she has, been, she has been actively conducting research related to women's security peace building in Asia, as well as religious and violence against women. Dr. Marden, you have the floor, 15 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Ibu Devi Wahab, and thank you very much for organizing this kind of uh, forum, which is very important. I'd like to convey the sincerely thanks to uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, the, the Republic of Indonesia. So for today's seminar, it, uh, I'd like to share the current situation and the complexity, including the challenge of work mm -hmm. in building up the capacity of women in peace process in the context of Thailand's southern part, or where the conflict has been taking place. And I like to look at uh, how women, peace, and security agenda can be applied into the local context. I like also to highlight uh, more on human security to the notion of gender equality and focus specifically in violent conflict area, as I just mentioned earlier about the conflict in, in Patan region. And the notion of peace building in dealing with uh, uh, for us in the south of Thailand. Uh, including among the members of the civil society organization in the conflict area. Uh, we found out the government attempts to generate peace apart from working with the opposite party or the so-called the separate peace movement while the, the process to translate within the goal of defeating the insurgency. This is uh, the scenario that happening in, in the South. At the same time, since the opposite party to the government have mainstream ethno-national and religious discourse into um, everyday life practice. Within this kind of context, Islamic traditionalists also has the dominant uh, power in the region. From the recent report of um, Southern Women Network Overcoming Violence, uh, two years ago, it shows the stories and the numbers of violent incidents against women that have largely gone under, under, report, under the report due to the stigma and the social uh, pressure. Although the number of incidents of the domestic violence is annually increasing in the Muslim community. So in, in this kind of peace building scenario, um, women who are not part of the insurgency are uh, entirely ignore. Um, nevertheless, uh, the violence in the region affect women both uh, direct and indirectly. They have been killed, injured, traumatized, sexually harassed, and have experience in emotional and economical suffering uh, during the conflict uh, persistent. Women are also tackle discriminatory gender norms within their own culture. So, uh, this is a parallel to the challenge of the implementation process and the policy on gender equality and women empowerment by the state and international agency, especially when the framework of uh, women peace security agenda, there is an attempt to promote a bottom up uh, peace building perspective in conflict area where women and member of civil society organization experience the community uh, position that is the tension between the Thai and Patani relations. So this is a kind of uh, historical uh, background that influence uh, the current situation. The tension leads to um, enduring violence since the state relies on military force to secure order. However, I have to thank to my government as well that has signed the international agenda, even though it does not yet, we do not yet have national action planned to stretch a 1325 implementation. 
There are current discourse on peace building that uh, accommodate women's participation in the peace process. But uh, the it is introduced by UN agency, especially by UN women, the central government, the NGOs on uh, uh, 1325, women's peace security agenda, CEDAW and so on. Um, however, this kind of perception on cultural norms have less particular concern to culture gender-based violence and violence against women. The programs that the government and many other organizations work for women in conflict situations have limits focus on the visible of women to involve in peace building. So regardless of such limitation, there are already some local efforts to cooperate women peace security agenda in the establishment of the meeting with the grassroots women organization. Uh, women peace security agenda also have led to pragmatic action in local efforts um, to craft a country's policy on gender and security. On the practical level, uh, to deepen the application on women peace security, the Thai government has uh, relied on women's group comprised of those whose the husband have been killed or missing in the region. At the same time, several international NGOs have joined force with uh, women's NGO to persuade the government. This is, this is a kind of advocacy that is good. This is a good strategy to point to the further support mediation as well as the peace process. Among the local women, the problem of identity is related to how uh, the womenness is um, defined through the various global discourse. They are reflecting as well as uh, my own experience when women have, uh, the navigate, have to navigate both in patriarchal culture and under the structure that setting on uh, religious society. It is more difficult when the state failure to consider women's voice in policy and to address the unrest issue. Um, local women groups criticize the state's implementation on women peace security agenda as well. And it doesn't aim at, um, by this complaint or the critic, uh, criticize, uh, they said that uh, it doesn't aim the structural change in the region, but support gender equality. So to women's meaningful participation in peace process have become stuck or entangled not only within the state agenda and global bureaucracy of, no, of the norms, but also on the ladder of uh, to exist, uh, the ladder of existing um, local social norms. As we learn from our uh, speakers uh, in neighboring countries of Southeast Asia, the recognition of women peace security is actually our first strategy on uh, prevention the violence and protection the issues that are already effective for peace builders and mediators. Um, so to the government and international actors, especially ASEAN Commission and the key stakeholder can restore uh, people confidence in peace building by uh, undertaking the concrete steps, such as the annual program with the budget to support women's forum that are likely to result in uh, to, to accelerate the implementation of women peace security agenda and to increase the space of education to educate the important uh, part of why uh, women peace security is important in relation to the mediation mechanism. It must go with the providing the resource to put for the larger engagement from the local and Muslim women's group that they have a very active in the role of uh, women peace building. Um, one of the greatest challenge to craft on um, national action plan and for supporting the consolidation of women's activism is the synchronicity between the elements of the states. As uh, so of the willingness to accommodate the resolution into national action plan, I would like to um, um, uh, response or give the feedback to the government that we also need to work constructively with the commitment and sincerity as um, Shadia and different other panelists emphasize on peace building from below. So the mediation and peace building from below is the space for more bottom up and gender sensitive uh, peace process is uh, important. They are important. 
the challenges of the role of militarized patriarchal gender identities, which is also in impact on women, it should have to be considered. The design of local peace building narratives uh, that um, uh, Shamani also mentioned about the narrative as well as different other panelists, um, try to associate the religious framework. However, in the local context, the interpretative norms can also lead to animal gender discrimination about the role of women in the society where they place, uh, when they place the place of women on the lower step in the hierarchy than men. So just uh, would like to hear a lot as well from uh, um, audience uh, online as well as the response from the floor. So thank you. Um, is it? Am I on mute? Okay, I'm mute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Marden. I think you have raised an important uh, aspect also, particularly with regard to the cultural norms and identity of womanness needs to be taken into account when you wanted to increase more participations of women as negotiators and, and as mediators. Uh, I think you also have uh, uh, touched upon on the bottom-up uh, peace process, which has been also uh, conveyed or discussed by other panelists, is uh, important in terms of uh, in terms of having um, commitment and sincere uh, process of um, uh, a peace process. So I guess. Uh, uh, colleagues, we have five uh, panelists. We have uh, around 20 to 30 minutes uh, time uh, for discussions. Uh, uh, if uh, participants have questions for uh, a particular panelists, you can um, address now. Uh, perhaps I can ask a help for Secretariat from Ibu Yanti whether there have been any uh, questions. I see some comments, if I can read the comments uh, from Raja Kamira. I totally agree with Ms. Sadia on the documentation is so important. We need to have a good documented process, a success stories of women, supporting women to motivate the other, especially recruiting young women and, and get inspired like Ms. Shadia. Uh, and also, uh, Raja Kamaria uh, said, I think we need more programs on gender awareness, especially among mediators and negotiators. This is to eliminate any kind of violence, especially when gender issues are raised. So these are some comments. Um, I was wondering if I was wondering if panelists uh, would like to share some um, opinions and especially I think, uh, our government needs to get more input whether we need to have a, a dedicated woman, a network, a special dedicated network uh, uh, encompasses women mediators and uh, negotiators in Southeast Asia. So some of the parties, some of the panelists have mentioned that, but I would like to deal more, I, I would like to dwell more on that, is, on that particular issue. So I give the floor to any uh, panelists who would like to give uh, comments on this. Please. Who would like to? Okay. Uh, hang on. Okay. If I can read the list of questions addressed to all speakers. Uh, can I read all the questions addressed to all speakers? What are the views of the speakers regarding the initiative to establish Southeast Asia Network? I just mentioned that. So I would like to uh, ask the panelists on that uh, issue. Uh, the second question is, is the involvement of women in peace process an international norm that is trying to be interna internalized in every country in Southeast Asia? or has the involvement of women in peace 
actually been a domestic value and norm in Southeast Asian country for a long time, but the norm is still confined by patriarchal patriarchy social construction. Uh, number three is what would be the key elements to integrate when we are preparing for young women mediators dealing with violent extremism? How would you see the role of women mediators different? I think three questions first. Please. Dr. Miriam, Professor Miriam, if you have some uh, inputs, can I start with you or Ibu Shadia? Yes. Uh, uh, Miriam, you can no, start. Go ahead. No, please. Shadia, please, Shadia. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think the it, it is a very good question and um, the importance to showcase globally that Southeast Asia can actually uh, use this model of uh, championing women and mediation, not only as a network, but really a meaningful one. I think that mm. is the, the, mm. the key that we want to address um, today is to have a, how can we have a meaningful network? So it's just mm. not just end up to be a network of women, um, but also to have a meaningful, like uh, uh, some sort of pool of women mediators in Southeast Asia, Mm. Uh, which in this case, it will be beautiful if, if, if this can be initiated by the government of, of Indonesia. Mm. Uh, mm. And also, uh, on, the, on the other note, is probably the creation of subject matter. I think this is quite a key because many of us uh, have different uh, sort of knowledge. Mm. Uh, so that would be great if we can have a, a sort of a creation of SME subject matter experts so that all, all of us based on those uh, different knowledge can be addressed uh, when, when needed. Um, and also uh, Asia Foundation have a very uh, high, a very extensive report on, in conflict in, uh, on conflict in Southeast Asia. I think we can also uh, expand that by mm. uh, engaging the role of women and how women can actually uh, participate in taking uh, part in uh, peace building process or conflict management process, mediation, mm. negotiation. Mm. Um, mm. The other one is probably coaching, mentoring and shadowing. I, I would love to, for example, to shadow with Professor Ferrer, for example, in, his, in her work. Uh, it would be an honor for me, you know, to, to, to learn from each other. I think uh, a lot of students also wants to uh, to take in my, uh, when I do mediation, they want to do shadow and, uh, and, and, mm. and also my, my, to share my time for coaching and mentoring. So this, this is something that I think we can mm. share among us women. And uh, also from, for the government, I think to have a budgeted program uh, on this particular issue, especially if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs wants to have this, uh, uh, you know, on their plate. And it's, it, it would be great to have a budgeted program and, and uh, a professional run, you know, sort of a mediation, team mediation expert in Southeast Asia. And, and of course the monitoring and evaluation would be a, a key for a success. Thank you. I will add more later. Thank you. Thank you, Bushadia. Professor Vera, Miriam yes, Vera. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the, uh, the selection of uh, uh, presenters today because they really provided all together their all aspects, local, national, community consultations, community mediation, and then how these are all bridged together. I think these were all very well reflected under different circumstances from uh, still very active conflict, for instance, in the case of uh, some, some places like Southern mm. Thailand and to a certain extent the Philippines. So mm. it's just really good all around in completing the picture. Second, I'd like to express my condolence to Shadia uh, for the passing of Noor Julie. We Work with Nordin. Nur Julie before. Nordin Abdurrahman. Yeah. Nordin Abdurrahman. Okay, so a different person. <laughs> very sorry about that. And in any case, um, you know, we know that this, um, these struggles have been going on for the longest time, and these people are not getting any younger. And it's good that they have had, uh, some kind of a chance to be able to, you know, to play a role in the governance of uh, their uh, their places, and uh, that was certainly part of the achievement of the peace process 
but let me go now to the uh, the point about um, uh, organizing that kind of a network in the region. I think, and networks are very good. Uh, there is a new framework in the gender discourse about network advocacy, meaning how to be able to integrate precisely all the initiatives and being able to build this network. We know that there is the initiative to set up a women's peace registry under the ASEAN ISIS, but I don't see any parallel initiative and intersecting because these parallel initiatives can actually intersect. And there are also informal networks. We ourselves, among several members of the panel here, we have started talking about uh, having some kind of a regional network precisely to strengthen that kind of sisterhood within the Southeast Asian region. So all these, these energies can complement. We do not have to be competitive in these different endeavors. We will fill in the spaces or, and bring in the different strengths to address uh, specific weaknesses of one or the other formal and informal network. So that should be the spirit uh, behind uh, this initiative. And we will, we will appreciate if some, um, if the Indonesian government, uh, the women in the Indonesian government, all very powerful, be, uh, take the lead in creating this avenue. I'd like to address a short uh, question from Malaysian, uh, a Malaysian woman about the young, how to bring in the young women uh, and be part of this network of mediation efforts. I think this is really very important uh, question because we need to bring in the next generation. We will not be able to solve the problems. In fact, we'll be leaving the next generation with newer problems and even the old ones. And so certainly they have to be uh, brought into the picture. And my, my, my short advice on that is to start where you are. are. Are you in a school, in a university? Are you part of an organization? Are you part of a community, a neighborhood where there are certain peace issues? Then see what you can do about it. it, it I mean, where did all these people playing roles in the national level or even in international level start? They started where they are. And it's that kind of painstaking work that you can do wherever you are and you build on it. And then precisely this network can help, help create that kind of you know, pulling up and getting everybody, getting uh, everybody on board. There's certainly advantages now. Uh, I remember when we were organizing this protest in the university, a young person came up to me, but how can I be heard? How can my voice be heard? Nobody interviews me. The media doesn't come to me and ask for my opinion. But now nobody asks that question because you have the tools. You have social media to be able to express yourself. And indeed, a lot of the battle of our peace and conflict is being done in social media. And that's, that's an arena, that's an arena in itself and something that is accessible to all the young people. But beyond social media, beyond the virtual world, get, get the action done in the real world. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you. Other panelists? I'd like to invite other panelists. Can you share? Sure. Dr. Yeah. Okay, um, Bangonga. Oh, no, no. Just or uh, XX. Anyway, yeah, um, it's very interesting. Uh, I would just like to share that um, last December, I think Shadia and myself were involved in, and also one of the women who asked a question, uh, Ruby, when everybody, uh, we had a reflection session with women who are involved in mediation and negotiation at the grassroots level. And then when we talk of, is there a need for a network? And we felt that there's a need for a network. And as I mentioned in my sharing, that we need a community. We need a space where we uh, have, we are free. We are not fearful of what we're going to share because we need somebody who can accompany us even in our journey in different areas. We may, be ha we may have different context, but I think the support that we need is very important the assurance, the affirmation, and the community where you can have a sounding board. Second concern that was also raised during the reflection session was the need for more opportunities for capacity building, as also shared. And even um, in inviting more young women to such processes. 
So as Ma'am Ye mentioned, start where you are. So in our community at the barangay level, so we start inviting more young people, young women to processes. Not necessarily immediately to negotiation or mediation, but during dialogue. Because for us, dialogue is one of the foundations as in negotiation and uh, mediation processes. So we invite more women, young women, to participate and provide them the space to facilitate some dialogues themselves. And we are there to accompany. So I think it's also very much important for us who are already in this field to have that mentoring capacity, accompany uh, as we uh, invite, uh, provide these spaces to young people. And what question also that is raised in terms of, is it that, uh, is it all only an international norm where women are invited uh, or women are recognized as mediators. As for our experience concretely uh, um, right now in Lanao, the sur where I am very much involved in, I think it's not only an international norm. There are already local, uh, locally recognized women who are already acting as mediators on the ground. And for us, we just need to surface these experiences of women in Southeast Asia who are already mm. involved. No, mm. It's not an international norm, I say, but probably mm. still we have to surface, we have to share the story because there are a lot of women who are already involved in mediation and negotiation process. It may not be informal peace talks or state-to-state um, um, -state or um, government between um, uh, revolutionary group talks, mm. but mm. community level, there are already mm. who are already involved. That. So we just mm. have to tell that story. So I think that's mm. uh, just my sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bangunga. Um, Ibu Da Silva or Dr. Dreden? Yeah. Dr. Um, Mandun? Yeah. Silakan, Ibu Da Silva. Yeah, from uh, myself, I just uh, want to address that uh, breaking the resistance to inclusion on the way forward. Uh, oh, women right. should form uh, solidarity groups that sustain mm. individual interest in participation. They also mm. need training and formal education. And finally, there should be a uh, the greater commitment by international agencies and mm. national government and greater effort to work toward the inclusion of women in peace processes. Mm. In this position, let's say to have a bilateral commitment to pursue of women's roles as mediators and negotiators. And mm. let me also share the, the success that the government of Timor-Leste so mm. For K, which is in the implementation of NAP 1325 itself. Mm. Oh, and this Ministry of Social Solidarity is um, uh, led uh, the NAP 1325. They have also a commitment to work with the line ministry how to monitor mm. the program, how we can mm. link and align the budget into the program. Mm. So this mm. is what I would like to say. Also, the other things that, that uh, the network also will be a good uh, chance for the negotiators or so the mm. mediators, mm. That they can build their capacity as a mediators. So why not, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, that um, the existing uh, community-based practices that uh, the UN agencies have, uh, let's say that uh, the UN women have their community of uh, women, peace and security, UNDP, they also have kind of like a uh, create the network, a network called um, uh, NPEACE, which is we only mm. uh, for two times in the Philippines, but I have no idea if this is still exist or not. So mm. we can use the existing network that so far uh, we have and uh, work together with the uh, organizations they are, that they are focused and they 
women's rights, women's equality things. So yeah, thank you. This is what I would like us to to highlight it. Yes, uh, Dr. Madren. If you yes, have some, uh, yes. Yes, uh, in terms of uh, the situation in, in Thailand, uh, we need to learn a lot from uh, friends in uh, different countries, as already mentioned a lot about uh, the strategy and the way out. Um, as far as we have work, uh, and there are so many women's group work on uh, peace building informally, especially on the ground with different uh, community, they try to, um connect with uh, the government as well sometimes they also would feel uncomfortable if the agenda is kind of enforcing to do so so for from my perspective it is uh, important uh, for all of uh, civil society organization and different other tech sectors like um uh, academia and uh, the government uh, ourselves also need to go to the root of uh, root of the cause of conflict that need to be addressed from women's experience. So the narrative from women is important. We have uh, uh, documentation from uh, academias as well as group of women who already made, uh, document their own experience. But we also need to highlight on that. So the second uh, point would be the legal substantive framework that uh, can support women's mediator and women who work on the ground and protect them by uh, legal system. This is uh, one of the concern because uh, we are still under the martial law and we need that kind of protection to the local community, especially women's uh, representative or the and when we need the women to get more involved, we have to concern on that issue as well. Another issue that I already mentioned in my talk is about uh, the regional agenda, because we now know that ASEAN uh, have discussed uh, among the members of the commission, com uh, commissioners, as uh, we also discussed earlier in parallel section on the mediator in Southeast Asia. So it also needs the support from the region uh, and set it as the important agenda in this regard. So there is um, a point that I write, I like to reflect. Um, thank you. Uh, perhaps if I can uh, ask a questions to all panelists, uh, I wanted to put uh, this discussion into the current context. Uh, I think Busadia mentioned about the role of women in addressing pandemic COVID-19. And Ibu Da Silva also mentioned about uh, climate change. So uh, I wanted to put in the context that now we are facing not only traditional challenges, which is conflict like we have in Aceh, like we have in um, Timor Leste previously. Uh, so it's, it's armed conflict, but we also have non-traditional challenges like climate change and currently pandemic. And according to World Bank, uh, New York Times, or The Economist, medical workers, many of them are women. So if we want to mediate uh, the, uh, or, or negotiate the increase, the equity of their salary, of their um, conditions, uh, will, that, will this uh, um, also be um, important in terms of uh, the role of women because to me as a woman we need also to be able to negotiate all this uh, uh, no, uh, in addressing non-traditional challenges so I, I was wondering if some of the uh, panelists can and can have a reflection on that please you have the floor So maybe I will start. Uh, is uh, Leonisha going to speak? Ah, okay. So just uh, just a note that the fact that you have organized women on the ground, and maybe Charmaine can also talk about this because uh, of the work with uh, of uh, Miriam College Center for Peace Education on uh, together with Balai Mindanao on women peacekeepers, right? You see that 
once you have this organization uh, effectively on the ground, they can easily, you know, become agents, agencies or mechanisms for addressing the, the crisis of the moment, and which is, for example, the, the pandemic. And we did see that kind of uh, uh, effective response coming up from uh, organizations that are based on the ground, helping monitor, doing contact tracing, information campaigns everywhere in the world, as uh, reported, for instance, within the UN system. Many of the women who have been organized as part of these networks have become effective actors in uh, promoting uh, the steps to be taken to be able to prevent the spread of the pandemic. In Libya, for example, where you have the challenge of the pandemic and ongoing peace processes in Yemen as well, you see this kind of, you know, uh, being able to do the dual tasking of being of still keeping afloat their engagement in the peace process and at the same time working in that context of the pandemic. So the key here is really when we say we want women to be empowered, it really rests a lot on being able to form these organizations among themselves and having it as that kind of an, uh, the, the mechanism to be able to work together and address any threat or any um, any difficulty that is there facing their communities. So the same also for being able to campaign for uh, the health workers, uh, being able to support that kind of uh, uh, glob uh, a global change in priorities, uh, prioritizing the public health sector in terms of budget and support for the personnel because we really, really appreciate the kind of um, sacrifices that they have taken to be able to address the pandemic. Thank you. Hello? Please, please, uh, you have some point, yeah. Yes, uh, I would just like to continue what uh, Mom EA has started. Um, yeah, sure. Indeed, uh, yeah, during this pandemic, um, the women who have been organized Basically, yeah. who are trained in peace building were the ones, so the first responders. Uh, they're the first responders in this pandemic, and then they're the ones who are, really go to the community, um, uh, do the research, uh, um, asking, uh, looking at the situation on the ground, different communities, and at the same time, are the ones doing relief operations. Um, like the women in Aliwasan and in Surigao, the, the ones that are organized for GN, uh, w, uh, WP. Um, they are very, uh, for me, we are inspired with the courage that they have, you know, given, the, given the risk that they're facing with the, with the pandemic. But I think it's also important to know that, um, uh, I don't know, I'm not so sure of the figures, but I think based on observation, most of the women, uh, may, many of the responders are at the health sector right now are women. But I think generally speaking, uh, at, uh, as of this time, I think there's a clamor really for support for all the health workers. It's either a woman, you may be a woman or a man, but at, as of this moment, um, we are putting people at risk, basically. And in the Philippines, we, it's, it's very... Um, uh, it's, it's very... Uh, glaring um, uh, threat. So for us, um, support to health workers, not only on salaries, but provisions of, of um, what you call it, so provision of even a room where they can stay, a house where they can be provided uh, necessary support, um, where they could rest. And I, I think the whole aspect of humanitarian support even to them not only to the communities that are affected. So I believe um, uh, we also have to look into the, um, for the women's issues, let me say, um, who are also involved in this. We have to identify what are the situation, what are the vulnerabilities or the risks that they are also facing. So we also have to address that. So I, I think many are also uh, looking into that as of the moment. Thank you. I think one more. It's not only the pandemic. A lot of conflicts are uh, violent conflicts are ongoing now. There are some displacements even. Sure. Yeah. 
So I think um, it's also very important for us to look into that. And then yeah. many of our volunteers, who so are mostly women, are also looking into that and also helping communities uh, surface the issues. And sure, sure. Them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bakonga. Uh, Bu Sadia and Dr. Mredin. Yeah, I think uh, there is an element of, uh, d due to the COVID-19, uh, many are taking this, for example, in increasing securitization. You know, in place like Colombia, uh, for example, the numbers of military uh, deployed more in the villages uh -huh. because to checking on the Same. COVID, but, uh, but they're working on something else, you know, being posting in, in villages and, and also in other places uh, that I learned also in Myanmar recently with, in the Rakhine state uh, between the Chin uh, IDPs and also the fighters from the AA. Uh, so that actually overemphasizing securitization during the COVID, maybe it's good to check, you know, um, uh, people's mobility from one village to another. But when it comes to controlling the movement uh, of civilians, then that would be an issue. So I think some, some government and some, you know, whoever in power abuse this, this uh, uh, and use this opportunity for their own benefit. So uh, I've seen also in Yemen, uh, increasing uh, situation and those who are actually stranded, not only women, also men and women and children. So uh, this situation is quite concerning and alarming when it comes to um, uh, higher securitization uh, process. And also some politicians are using this for their own benefit, you know, um, populists are using for their own uh, elections and uh, using the health sector as the, as a tool for them to to win the election and, and so forth so uh, we've seen uh, many things actually emerging from this conflict and yes this is still new the pandemic but uh, if you look at it it's actually uh, they are recycling you know from the previous conflict by using pandemic as as a strategy um. Dr. Martin? Uh, yes. Um, yes, please. There are so many important points already uh, elaborated and addressed uh, from the panelists. And I totally agree with this kind of reflection and recommendations. In terms of um, the, uh, the scenario or the issues, uh, situation as well in the South, we know that women work on the ground in, uh, in the community. And uh, during, the con uh, during the pandemic, uh, especially during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, women still have a very big role uh, to travel to the place nearby. And they have very good uh, support from their own networks. They create a concrete, con uh, concrete contribution to the society, and it, it brings the empowerment to others as well. Uh, another flip side of the situation, because uh, everyone was locked down, especially in the deep south where um, the, the pandemic uh, have the very uh, fast and very high spread uh, group of people from the religious commission, uh, missionaries. Uh, who travel from abroad and coming back to the, the community. It is very fast in the sense of uh, um, transmission. In this regard, uh, the role of religious leader is important because um, the, the authoritative uh, group of uh, leaders in uh, country level may also need uh, the group of people who are in conflict area because the, the widespread of, of pandemic uh, of COVID-19 in uh, Patanigya Lanaratiba provinces. And this is still in conflict zone as well. So uh, the, the, the Shikun Islam, which is the formal authoritative agency uh, supported by government need to, um, tr need to find a strategy to cooperate their work with the local religious leaders as well as with women. So this is a, the, the scenes showing that uh, one uh, 
um, agency could not, one agent could not work on their own. So they need women, they need the local community. So I, I like to emphasize that um, it, it is important to translate the, um, uh, the local understanding of um, peace building and it needs really the role of women to be involved. Um, the time is approaching to the end of the session. I hope you can hear our my voice. It's raining very hard. <laughs> it, <laughs> I hope you can hear uh, my voice. But uh, just uh, a bit of a summary. So first, uh, I guess, takeaway from this um, session is the skill of negotiation and uh, mediation for women is important in addressing not only traditional challenges, which is conflict, but also non-traditional challenges like now, pandemic or climate change. And sometimes um, it's a mix between traditional and non-traditional challenges. Second one is, yes, uh, I guess uh, speakers are um, happy with the establishment of a network with, uh, with emphasis that network for not, not network itself, but more on the program capacity building, shadowing like Bushadia said, and capacity building from I think uh, Ms. Um, uh, um, Charmaine mentioned that. And third, I think this, uh, 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 this discussion is not an end in itself, it's a process. So we are hoping to get a, a more um, a close network, uh, share experiences where we can emulate uh, to other women and uh, invite more young women to be able to uh, play a part in mediation and uh, uh, negotiation. Before I conclude, I would like to give one minute for each panelist to say a few words or um, uh, la convey last message, please. Starting with Professor Mere uh, Ferrer. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion. And uh, I think basically what we, I have to say is that uh, we are working on partnerships. There will be times when we need to work first among women to ensure that everybody is bought on board. But at the end of the day, what we want is that kind of an, uh, a society which welcomes uh, the participation of all an inclusive society built on partnership and sisterhood and brotherhood and everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well said. Uh, Ibu Saida, please. Yes, uh, I think I, I would uh, certainly applaud the idea of having the network uh, because this has been something that I personally passionately have been dreaming of and also uh, I'm sure other women in this region uh, have been dreaming about to have a, a meaningful network to, to start uh, working in Southeast Asia. Uh, the other important thing that I would like to highlight is also the importance of political reconciliation, because as you see in many countries, in many government, also in, um, in the community, uh, the tendencies of increasing uh, the political differences is quite high, not only uh, because of the election and all that, but also in other uh, issues. Uh, so political reconciliation is an opportunity for women also to take part in, in addressing these issues and also to raise awareness among the women. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ibu, Ms. Uh, Charmaine Bagonga, please, you have the floor. Or Ibu Da Silva first, anyone? Yeah, uh, let, sure. me, let me let me oh, in sorry. first. Yeah, um, I just want to say something in regards to what we have uh, discussed, especially for networking and uh, uh, feel uh, when do we see that women still face many barriers, especially women often have no direct access to, med to mediator or the official mediation and negotiation teams. And there is no official and standardized mechanism for assessing information about the peace process and developing women interests. And I also uh, 
uh, would like to raise that also in link to what um, uh, Ibu Sadia said that still the lack of political campaigns to promote women's rights and their participation in official peace processes and to address the network in the Southeast Asia. I think this is very important in terms of how we can build the capacity of the young mediators. So you have uh, the Center of Peace Institute, you have a um, Mindanao Peace Building Institute. They have a, a, a good accreditation on this and it would be good that we can bring the young mediators. They can, they can learn something from the mediators that you have. So this is what I would like to, to uh, recommend if we have a chance to have to, to build this network. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ibu da Silva. Miss Bagong, ba, Charmaine okay. Bangonga. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, quickly, for me, uh, peace building really led me to many places and to many cultures to many histories and a lot of understanding and covering has taken place. We take chances and we take risks. We learn, we study, and we also unlearn. And for me, um, a bit emotional or a bit personal, I'm already 45 years old. I'm a mother of a 19-year-old son, and I feel I'm getting old, and yet injustice, violence are still existing in many forms. And I, have, uh, I don't want my son to live in a deprived freedom to choose what we wants to be. So I want him to fight the violence in different way, not in firing gun to the enemy, but in fighting the enemy that oppresses humanity. And I think the nurturance, uh, the manner, the, the innate nature of us women, the nurturing aspect of us is still very important at this time. So we have to nurture equity, justice, peace, and love. So we are still in this revolution. Peace. Baby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Marden, you have yes, last uh, one minute. Uh, yes, for the last point, uh, I'd like to <laughs> emphasize on uh, the, the change, the structural change in the region as well as in my own country is very important. Um, many women's group work hard in, in the field, in, in the community. And there are supports uh, from the NGOs, in, including international NGOs. They travel to other places to learn how to build up a peace process, how to um, make women, women's meaningful participation, as well as very constructive involvement. So the, the, the process that can link between the activities from the ground with the government policy uh, would be a must of urgent uh, point to uh, to implement, as well as the support from the region, uh, from ASEAN and from uh, different other sectors that have the, the role as well as the experience to build peace uh, in, 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 in different uh, levels of uh, the conflict. So this is uh, a call as well. And this is the message from the community too. Thank you. So I, I like to stop here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all the speakers. I think we have run out of time, but uh, again, my uh, our appreciations, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs appreciations to uh, your, um, your time, to your presentation, and let's make women be a, a source of peace rather than a source of victims. So again, thank you so much. And I'll, uh, I'll turn over to the MC uh, for the, some announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. thank you for all the speakers and moderator for the fruitful discussion. Uh, we have now come to the end of the second session of our web seminar. Please join us again for session three on regional women mediator networks best practices from other regions in enhancing women's meaningful participation and influence in peace processes at 2 p.m. today and the closing session of this web seminar later this afternoon. A web up session will also be held after the session three. So looking forward to have you join us again shortly. Thank you very much. <laughs>